How does one talk about Jesus to someone who lives in a country where the church is underground? You see, the most important thing that happened when we met Jinji in New Zealand two years ago was that Jinji had never heard about Jesus. She didn't know who he was or what the Bible was about. We were able to introduce her to these stories. We found a Bible in one of the hostels we were staying at and sent that back to China with her. And here we are now, two years later, sitting in her apartment in Beijing, China, and she's telling us that she's been reading the Bible and telling her sisters that maybe they should all learn more about this Jesus. But now what? What happens next? Where do we invite her to continue her spiritual journey? Would an underground church take a risk on her? Would she take a risk on them? There are so many questions and so many obstacles that we'll keep facing as Jinji continues her spiritual journey and as we continue our friendship with her. But whatever the barriers or difficulties may be, there's one thing I know. Jinji is always worth it. Anybody ever heard of uh, Larry Walters? Larry Walters, uh, also known as um, Larry Launchair or Launchair Larry. Anybody ever, ever heard of Larry before? So Larry, Larry is a guy in Southern California in San Pedro, and uh, uh, he was one of the first guys to ever do this. I'm pretty sure. I think from what I read from. But Larry, Launchair Larry, uh, he he had this bright idea with his buddies, him and his friends and his girlfriend. And they were getting ready to um, uh, buy, I think it was like 45 eight feet uh, uh, weather balloons. And he was going to fill them up with, with helium, which he did. They all went out to the, their local store there in San Pedro, Southern California. They bought these 45 weather balloons. They're huge, eight feet tall weather balloons. And they tie it to his lawn chair in his backyard. And... And it's him and his buddies and his girlfriend. It's tied to the lawn chair. These water balloon, or, or these balloons are filled up with with um, with helium inside. And, and they had this bright idea. Larry was thinking that man, if I can just hover over my house for just about 30 feet to 100 feet, just to kind of see what's what's, what's up there. So Larry had he, he had a passion to be a, a, a pilot in the Navy, but but he, he his eyesight was pretty bad, so uh, he didn't make the cut. And so he had the bright idea to kind of test it out himself, you know. He didn't get to fly in the Navy, but he'll, he'll fly somehow. And so he got these, these, these balloons tied to his lawn chair with his friends. And uh, this, it's attached to his Jeep because that's how you're going to keep it down from actually floating. And so eventually they cut the cords that's attached to this Jeep. And the lawn chair with Larry goes flying up into the air. Now... Larry, don't worry about this. He, he got the essentials. Okay, he got the essentials. He had a parachute on with a pellet gun, okay, and some sandwiches and a six-pack of Miller Lite. Okay, hashtag essentials. Essentials. He's got what he needs. He's got a camera as, as well and a radio. And so it, it, the, he's let loose. He's in the air. He's only, okay, this is attention. It's only be about 100 feet in the air. 45 minutes in, he's about 1,600 feet in the air. Okay, if any of you have ever been skydiving, I have, you're only legally allowed to go 14,000 feet in the air. So he's 16,000 feet in the air, hovering all these balloons. There's the picture of, of Larry, Launch Air Larry, in the sky, 16,000 feet in the air. And he has his sandwiches, his Miller Lite, his, his, his Pella gun, just in case if he gets too high. But he gets scared that if he pops the balloons, um, it's going to off kelter him and he's going to, you know, fall over. And so he He's, he's, in, he's in the sky for 45 minutes, 90 minutes he's, he's gone by. He's up there, 16,000 feet in the air. And it's crazy because while he's up there, the first to, be, to spot him was a United pilot. The pilot radioed into uh, a, a, a federal aviation into the airport because he's hovering over the airport now. They radioed and said, hey, um, I just uh, passed a guy with a launcher and a Pelican. <laughs> And so 
he, he, Larry has a radio in his lap. And so somehow they're able to radio him in and like, hey, what's going on? And this is what the information that's communicated to Larry. It says, what information do you wish me to tell the airport at this time to your location and your difficulty? <laughs> Larry says something like, um, this is unauthorized balloon launch. And I don't have a permit for this. But it's okay, I'll be fine. I'm sure my on-ground crew has reported the proper authorities. And so they did. 45, 90 minutes passed by. He finally musters up the courage to shoot some balloons down. And he shoots it on both sides to kind of bring them down. And eventually he starts to descend slowly back into Long Beach. This is two cities away from his destination. He's descending down and, and <laughs> it was going good for a time. Until he, he, as he descends, he lands in this, like, power line. And he's caught, his balloons are caught in this power line. And by this time, all the cops and the press and the authorities are kind of down there just waiting for him, like, to come down. He's dangling from these power lines. Crazy. He finally gets down, called the fire department. They rescue Larry in his lawn chair. They put the lawn chair in a museum for people to just come by and watch what happened. He gets down. Uh, the cops take him. He gets fined $4,000. And, yeah, exactly, right? Only 4000 And the press saw him before he got in the vehicle and said, Hey, Larry, why did you do it? Like, why did you, why, why did you do this? And he said these words. He said, A guy just can't sit around, you know? <laughs> I can't just sit around like this is what I wanted to do. My entire life was to fly. And so now I'm just going to figure out another way to do it. I tell you that to tell you this. That God has called you and God's called me to make a difference. And sometimes we just can't sit around and wait for everybody else to go out and do something else. But maybe in your family, in your household, in your finances, in your startup, in your business, in this church, God's called us to step into the the unknown and to make a difference and risk the ocean, risk everything just to make a difference. And in our story today, Jesus is going to tell us a story about an unlikely character, an unlikely character that he inserts into the story and becomes a hero. So this is the story and where it picks up. It says this. On one occasion, an expert in the law set out to test Jesus. So here's this guy. He's an expert in the law, which means this. Look, he knows the first five books of the Bible. He's got it memorized front and back. He's an expert in the law. He's actually a lawyer. He went to school for this. This is what he's grown up knowing. He's grown up doing this his entire life. He's a lawyer, and he's memorized the Torah, the Jewish scriptures, all five books. He's got it memorized. So he stands up, and he sees Jesus in a crowd. It's the lawyer. It's Jesus. There's a bunch of people around them in a circle, and he stands up to test Jesus by asking him a question. You need to know this before we get into the story, that whatever question he asks Jesus, he already has an answer for it. He already knows the Bible. He knows the scriptures. He knows the Jewish law. And he, he knows what, he, what Jesus is going to say. He's, he expects something from Jesus. And so he's going to get ready to answer him to a question that he already knows what the answer is. So here's where it picks up. It says, the teacher, or he says, teacher to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So he says, hey, um, you know, I know the scriptures teach this, but hey, what must I do? to inherit eternal life. In other words, what can I do to have life that lasts forever? See, because in this Jewish time, they didn't talk much about eternal life, about life to come. They actually talked more about how to make a difference in the life that you lived now. And so from their perspective, for them to make a difference, for them to do something that lasts forever, he wanted to pipe up and ask Jesus the question, Jesus, what do I do? to live a life that will last not just here and now, but the life after, to last forever. And so Jesus says this to him. He says, what is written in the law? He replied, classic Jesus, right? He answers the question with a question. He says, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He says, you know the law, what's in there, and how, what's your interpretation of it? 
Now, you know he has the answer, right? You know that whatever he's going to say, he's already memorized it. He didn't need Jesus to ask him the question. He didn't need the audience to point and say, hey, this is what's actually in the law. This guy's got it memorized. So he says, Jesus says to him, what is written in the law and how do you read it? And the guy says, love the Lord your God with all your, what does that say? And with all your, and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. So he says, look, um, there's, the, there's the Torah, there's scriptures in Deuteronomy and, and other parts of the, uh, the Jewish scriptures. And it says for us to love the Lord your God, to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That means, look, I don't think he missed anything. <laughs> he says, with everything that you have, with all your whole being, with your body and with your material, with your immaterial, with every part of you, to love God to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, with everything you have to love him. And Jesus says, you have answered correctly. Jesus replied, do this and you will live. In other words, hey, this is how you have eternal life, a life that lasts forever, a life that you can live here and now but not just here and now, but that matters for eternity. This is how you do it. To live a life that lasts forever. It says, look, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all that's in you. Love God with everything and love your neighbor as yourself. He says, if you do this, you will live. This is how you have a life that lasts forever. A life that lasts forever. This is what you do to live a life that lasts forever. All right, see you. Thanks for coming. Have a good day. Like, the conversation should have ended right here. Like, the audience is there. The group of people that's there, there's some children there. The lawyer's asking Jesus this question. The audience is watching him going back and forth with Jesus and the lawyer as he's asking each other questions. And by this point, you could see what's like, they're picking up their Trader Joe's bags or they're heading back home, their non-perishable bags, their children, they're getting them. Like, hey, we're, we're leaving and the conversation's over. But except that that is not. It continues into another story. But he gets ready to ask Jesus another question. So the lawyer says, okay, everybody's getting ready to leave. The lawyer's like, whoa, whoa, come on, come on, come on. Wait, wait, wait where, where are you going? Stay here. Stay. No, no, stop, stop. Where you, hey, come back, come back, come back. Come on, come on. Come on, Jesus. Come on. And he says, come on, Jesus. But, but really, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? You know, that's a question oftentimes that um, we don't want to ask ourselves because it's going to force us to not just look across the street, right? But look down the street where there's somebody might not be in a proximity to you. And so he says to Jesus, come on, come on. Who is my neighbor? Really, he's getting to the point where he's like actually disagreeing with Jesus. Because this is what the, the, the actual situation is. He actually disagrees with Jesus with who his neighbor is for him. He disagrees with them. And so he says, look, come on, who, who, who is my neighbor? And that's when everybody else is like, okay, oh, this is a good question. Okay, we'll, we'll stick around. And so Jesus launches into the story about who is our neighbor. He says this, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of, of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. So here's this guy. He is on his journey, which is a rare journey for this guy to go from Jerusalem to Jericho, if you know the story. But he's on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho. And unexpected circumstances befall him. He's stripped of everything that he has. He's beaten there and he's left half to death in a pool of blood. And a priest walks by. About, the story tells us that a priest walks by. And you would think of all people that would have the decency to stop and to 
help this man that's lying there in a pool, of be- a pool of blood. The priest walks by. He sees the man lying in a pool of blood. And scripture, Jesus tells us that the man walks around this guy that's lying in a pool of blood. He actually says that he goes to the other side of him. It's actually a joke because the, 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 this road down from Jerusalem to Jericho, there's no other side. There's only one road. And so Jesus is really being funny. And so he says, this guy walks all the way on the other side of this guy t- just to get to his destination. I was uh, reading a book. Anybody ever heard of The Power of Habit? It's a pretty good book. And uh, uh, Charles Duhigg wrote the book. And uh, in the book, uh, he, does, he does like a research study that was done with uh, some college students. I believe it was at, H- at Harvard. And uh, there was three college students. That, that this study was done. Uh, and um, basically, uh, they kind of reenacted the story. So uh, there's this guy that they pretend to be lying there in need for help on this college campus at Harvard, and, and three college students go walking by, and they all ignore this guy. And it was for legitimate reasons at the end of the day. If, I think for two of them, some, one of the reasons were they had like an exam to get to. And so they actually, it wasn't that they didn't want to help him. They just had something more important. And so they walked around him and neglected to help to get to their destination, to get to what they thought was more important than what was in front of them. And these guys were also seminarians in Harvard. Charles Duhigg mentions in the book, you got to read it sometime, he mentions that the reason why these guys actually walked around was not because they weren't uh, benevolent, but the reason why they walked around was because they were busy. They had another agenda that was not on priority on their list. And so oftentimes, like maybe we're not as busy. Well, it's the Bay Area. We're pretty busy, right? And sometimes we think that, like, man, there's destinations and agenda. If you're like me, you have a schedule that you want to keep to, you want to get to. And oftentimes, though, if we hold on to our schedule, we miss what's right in front of us. And when we miss right in front of us, we actually miss a blessing because we get to participate in making a difference in someone else's life. And the thing that's ahead of us that's more important, we think, that's more important is actually less important. Because what's most important is a life. Is a thing that will last forever. And so this priest walks by, maybe because he's busy. He's got some ceremonial things to attend to. He's got a schedule he's got to keep to. But then also, not just a priest, a second guy walks by. He's a Levite. He's also a leader, an expert of the law. And so he walks by, leaving the man there half dead. Maybe he's got something else to do. Maybe he's busy. Maybe, maybe, maybe he's got a schedule to keep. Maybe he's got a friend to, to meet up with. Maybe he's got a dinner arrangement. Maybe, maybe he's, just, he's just not feeling benevolent that day. And so he also walks by, leaving this man there. I'm not sure how long he's been there, but I'm sure it's hours. He's there, half dead. The situation that he came across that, necessarily wasn't his fault, unforeseen circumstances, unforeseen things in his life that happened to him, and now he's there half dead. And two men who you would expect to step in walks around him. And then a third person walks by. And if you're Jesus, if you're Jesus... What makes the most sense in this story as he's talking to this lawyer is to insert the lawyer into the story. What makes the most sense for Jesus to say, look, these two guys walk by, they're, they're, it's, a, it's a priest, it's, it's a Levite. Uh, these guys are, 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 are familiar with the Jewish scriptures, with the Jewish law of how to, to love and to, and to be good to those around you, to love your neighbor. And, and, and he, the, the, the makes sense is to say the lawyer now, to insert him into the story, and says, look, the nice is the lawyer walks by and he helps this man. I'm sure you've heard the story before. 
But he doesn't say the lawyer. He chooses an unlikely hero. Jesus inserts the most unlikely character into the story and made him the hero. And you know who it is. It's the good Samaritan. That's what we call him, right? We call him the good Samaritan. But in the scriptures, in the Jewish, in times of antiquity, they didn't see him as a good Samaritan. They saw him as a Samaritan. Like, a Samaritan, good? Like, he would do, this is what it says right here in the scripture. It says, but a Samaritan, somebody says Samaritan, as he traveled came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. Look at your neighbor and say, he came where he was. He came where he was. Yeah, one more time. That was pretty bad. He came where he was. And so the Samaritan came near to where this man was. And scripture tells us that the Samaritan bandaged up his wounds, put him on his horse. I'm assuming it's a horse. I don't know. Put him on his horse. He takes him to a Holiday Inn, <laughs> an Airbnb. And he, and, and he pays for his resources, he's paid for his state, his, his, his night there. And he says, look, he, he tells the innkeeper, hey, whatever, whatever you need, I'm here. I'll take care of him. I, I, I'll go to distance. I, I'll make a difference. I got an arrangement to go to. But when I come back through, and if there's no one here to take care of his belongings, if no one here to take care of his arrangements, look, I will suffer whatever it takes. Whatever it takes, I'll put out, and I'll make sure I'll make a difference in his life. And so the Samaritan bandaged up his wounds, put him on his horse, and delivers him at the Airbnb, and there's this guy staying there overnight. A Samaritan, the most unlikely character to be inserted into the story. You see, because in, in, from their perspective, everybody in the audience at this time, they're just gasping for air. They're like, what? A Sam uh, who? He stepped in and did what? Did you... No way. No, no, no way. This is unbelievable. We can't believe this story, Jesus. You see, because there's years and years, over 500 years of, 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 of animosity and, and, and tension between the, the, the Jewish people and the Samaritans, where they consider to be half-breeds, considered to be less than people. And there's all this tension between these different races and ethnicity and and cultures, and they lived over there. They never came over here. And so when they saw that this guy was the actual hero of the story, they, the air was sucked out of the room. They couldn't believe that the Samaritan stepped in and made a difference. And the lawyer stands there. He's like, no. You probably walked in here and you probably think you're most, the most unlikely person for God to use. You probably walked in here thinking, look, I just got a nine to five and I hate it really, but I'm just doing it for now. You probably think, look, man, look, I don't have the resources. My, my job is insignificant. What I do on a regular basis to make it, it's insignificant. It's so small. My resources are small. Look, my, my, my apartment is small, 657 square foot. Look, everything around me is small. It's insignificant. But look, God uses the most unlikely people and inserts you into the unlikely places so that he can use you to make a difference. And here's this guy. being helped by a hero. A man that he didn't expect to help him. Really, he expected the priest or the Levite to jump in and to take care of his, his needs. But an unlikely hero steps in and he saves his life. Makes a difference in his life. Steps into his circle. Steps into his space. And we're still telling the story today because of the good Samaritan. Because of the good Samaritan. 
I am, um, I'm from Las Vegas originally, and uh, I didn't grow up in a Christian home or anything like that, but uh, my, I think it was, I was like 16 or 17 years old, I was like a junior in high school, and uh, someone invited me to church, and a friend of mine invited me to church, I was like, no way, not going, and maybe that's some of your stories, and uh, I slammed it, I was like, no idea, I'm not, not, not going to church. And he invited me again, came to one of my basketball games. It was like, I'm like, this, he's back and he's showing up in my life. And he just kept inviting me. And so eventually I went. I went to the service. I sat in the back. The uh, message was taught about Jesus and the gospel and how Jesus died for our sins to give us new life. And so for me, I didn't grow up in a Christian home or anything like that. My family wasn't religious. That wasn't part of our diet. We didn't do that spiritually. And I was kind of taken back by the love and the grace of Jesus. I was getting ready to leave after the service was over. And uh, this guy stopped me and asked me a question. He said, hey, if you know, did you know for sure that Jesus is your Savior and you can have your sins forgiven and have a home in heaven? I said, there's no way someone can know that. And he said, you got 30 minutes? I said, sure. We sat down on these pink pews. It was a Baptist church. Some of you, I just brought up some memories. It's okay. We'll move past it. We're sitting on these pews, and um, he, he opens the Bible and kind of walks me through the gospel and what Jesus did on the cross for us. I was so blown away that, like, Jesus, this guy who knew everything about me, good and bad, and yet he still loves me. And the Bible says, if I put, put my faith in him, I become a Christian. And so I did. I put my faith in Jesus, became a Christian. And this guy's particular his name is Fred. I have actually a picture of him here. Um, he led me to Jesus. And then... Fred just kept coming back into my life, though. Kept coming back in, kept coming back in, kept coming back in. Actually, eventually, um, I remember I was in high school, uh, senior at this time, senior in high school, um, getting ready to graduate. Uh, I was going to go play college basketball, and, and uh, Fred kind of discipled me for, like, an entire summer. Kind of taught me about Jesus and taught me the scriptures and how to follow God and stuff like this. And uh, around this time, I was having some difficulty with my, my family, some ups and downs. You've, you know, you've been there. Uh, my family is great. They're not perfect, but they're great, uh, hardworking people, uh, immigrants from Belize who moved to Las Vegas, moved their way up to upper middle class, and just a great family. But we were having some trouble at this time. Uh, and so I had to find a place to stay during this time. And so Fred um, called me and said, hey, I heard what's going on with your family. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna come pick you up. And so he, he came and picked me up. And he brought with him um, pizza. Come on, somebody. <laughs> That'll save everything right right now, okay? Uh, brought me a box of pizza, put me in his car. He took me to his house and um, put me inside of a room that they had there uh, with, like, these pink blankets for his kids. Like, he kicked them out and put me in there. And I stayed in, in, in that room for that night. And um, he came. I remember walked by my, he walked by my room. My door was open. And he saw me on my knees with, with the Bible, and I was praying, asking God to, to be with my family during this time. And, um, man, Fred was there for me during that time. I also remember passing that, walking through that time of life as I was getting ready to graduate. Um, Fred kind of influenced me and said, hey, maybe you should consider going to a Christian college. Eventually, I decided, you know what, I'll go check it out for a year. And I went to a Christian college for a year, and that's where I walked into culture shock. Like, this is a Christian college, like, very different from the culture that I grew up in. And I got there that year, and my life would just radically change. Um, God used the Bible and community um, to surround me to help me make a difference in my life. Eventually, I graduated from that college, and Fred called me and said, hey, what are you doing next? He said, I want you to come back here at this church and serve full-time as a youth pastor. And so I said, of course, no brainer. And so I graduated, walked off the stage of platform of graduation and then walked into uh, this position as a youth pastor for a couple years there. And that's where I served. And Fred came alongside me and walked with me as I was mentoring and pastoring the youth of this church and grew it to like 60 people. We started this thing in uh, the schools called FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And they're... Um, I built this, uh, this thing um, that kids from all over the city could come to and, you know, find a place to get pizza and, and hear about God. And uh, over the year, dozens of people came to Jesus because of it. 
And then God kind of starts to impress on me, like, hey, like, what do you want to do full time? And Fred came alongside me and said, hey, you ever thought about, like, being a pastor? I said, it's funny because I felt like God was really speaking to me about this. And so for about, like, a whole year, every six months, I would pray and ask God, God, what do you want me to do full time? And I remember going up to this mountain in Las Vegas with my Bible and just me and just figuring out, God, what do you want, what do you want me to do? Like, my life is yours. Like, whatever you want, I'll do it. And I felt that really God was in, encouraging me to um, step into this full-time pastor and to start a new church that's refreshing, authentic, and life-giving from scratch. And so I didn't know where. But eventually, um, my wife was living in the Bay Area and I flew out here with Fred, and him and I kind of surveyed the entire Bay Area from San Jose to East Bay all the way to Livermore. And we did that for like six months, figuring out like, hey, where does God want me to start this church? And I fell in love with Oakland and the East Bay because I think there's something special here that's happening. And so... I told Fred, I think, I think it's Oakland that God's called me to start this church. And he said, I'm with you 100%. We went back to Las Vegas, shared the vision with this church that I grew up in, that my dad became a Christian in, my senior year of high school, and I served there on staff. And they all jumped on board and said, yes, how can we come alongside you? And they're now one of our main supporters in starting Storyline Church. They support us monthly. Um, they support us in coaching and resources and whatever we need. They come alongside Storyline to help make a difference in Oakland and the East Bay. Fred was actually here for a grand opening. And he sat right over there to see 260 people fill this auditorium to see what God's actually going to do through Storyline Church here in Oakland. Man, there's so many times I've seen Fred from 17 years old to now 28 years old. I know some of you thought I was like 19, but it's okay. And walk with me through this journey of seeing me just develop and grow and mature to now leading this church and leading it, leading it good, right? Am I doing a good job? Okay. And, and so Fred's just been huge in my life. And like you and like me, I'm sure you've probably seen this too, but there's so many needs here in Oakland and in the world, really, with the homeless community. Some of uh, our members here, they, they work in a uh, homeless community, leading uh, uh, dozens of people and over, over organizations and leading people even in Hayward and, and, and San Leandro. And man, there's so many needs here, from the homeless to uh, uh, youth being trafficked, and homeless here in Jacqueline Square, half a mile down the street from here. Man, there's, a, the needs are countless. But what are you and I to do about that? How, how do we make a difference in the life of someone else? Because God, when God puts something in you, he never puts it in you just for you. He puts it in you for the person next to you. And I want to say this to you, with all the needs that's happening, look, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. There's so many things out there, man, man, if I can help over here, man, if I can make a difference here, man, if I could leverage my time and my resource, look, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone, right? What you can't do for everyone, find the one and do for one what you wish you can do for everyone. And when you do that, here are some things, some tangible things that you can do to help make a difference in their life. Here's this right here. It says, look, uh, time, not just money. It's easy to give money, right? Money is so transactional, you know? We do this all the time with, at least I do, I'm not sure about you, at least all the time with homeless, the homeless community. Like, it's easy for me to roll down my window and say, here you go, here's some money. I feel like I've done what I'm supposed to do. It's just a transaction. So time, not just money. And then not also time, but, but also next longer rather than short, long-term rather than short-term. Sometimes we jump in and we want to make a difference, we want to see a result rapidly, 
But oftentimes, it's what matters in the difference is in the long distance, right? You stick with it for the long haul, you see the difference that's actually made in that person's life. So long term, not just short term, but also thirdly, uh, go deep rather than wide, right? It's easy to say, look, I'm just going to find a blanket and just like a blanket of people like, hey, all these people I'll make a difference in. But really, you can't really make a difference in someone's life. If you've got 20 people in your circle, if you've got 10 people in your circle, if you've got five people in your circle, look, go deep rather than wide. Find the one and go deep with that person. Do for one what you wish you can do for everyone. And this is why, and this is why we started this church. Because we believe that when a city is start, a, a church is started, a city should be better. We believe when a city, when a, when a church is started, not just the city is better, but your home is better. Not just the home is better, but the community is better. Not just the community is better, but an individual life is better. It's transformed. A difference is made in their life. And so, look, if you believe today that God's called you to make a difference in the life of someone else, look, I want you to celebrate what God's doing in, in this church, in your life. Because, look, if you just take your time, your resources, and your talents, and you invest it into one life, look, that life will go further, faster. Because what will last forever is a soul is a life because that life will invest into another life and that life will invest into another life and what happens look we might not change the world but you'll change somebody else's world and that at the end of the day that's what matters is changing someone else's world and so let me encourage you today to jump in and to make a difference in someone else's life because what god puts in you is never for you it's for the person next to you and this is why we have life groups this is why we've created life groups, a time that you can go deeper with other people, a time that you can get in community with other people and do life together and celebrate losses and celebrate wins. This is why we have opportunities for you to serve and to make a difference because when someone comes walking into the doors for the first time and they're unchurched, right, or they're de-churched, we talked about that last week, go watch the YouTube sermon, right, or they're churched, right, they can walk in and for the first time say, look, man, I feel like I belong here. I feel, like I, could, I feel like I can jump in here. Look, I don't have to believe to belong, but this is awesome. And this is why we will go the distance and we'll risk the ocean. We'll risk everything so that we can make a difference in someone else's life. So do for one what you wish you can do for everyone. Let me pray for you. God, thank you so much.